Hey, this is the national treasure, Nick Aldis, and you're listening to the All Night Long Wrestling Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the All Night Long Wrestling Podcast. We are your host, he's a stallion, I am the enforcer, and we are back with another edition, a new format here, if you will, at the All Night Long Wrestling Podcast, a non-Hurricane Isaiah-esque format, which is why we were not here last week. Because I didn't have fucking power for five days. Joe, good to see you back on the show, pal. Oh, thanks, buddy. I thought it was Hurricane Isis. Is that not is that not what it's called? No? Okay. Nope. All right. No. Hard no. Hard no. Hard no. All right, buddy. That's fine. So, oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me back. It's pretty I appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. Listen, here's what we're going to do. What we found out through our listeners, and by our listeners, I, I mean Bagu, mm-hmm. um, is that AEW is the talk of the town. NXT is the talk of the town. So, Thursday morning, hot, fresh, off the press, Thursday mornings at the Slop Shop. That's what I'm really trying to get trending yeah. here. So, what Joe and I are going to do is we're going to break down both shows, your AEW Dynamite, your Wednesday night NXT, and then we're going to give you our winner. That's what we're going to do. Um, there's really no point in talking about Raw or SmackDown, to be honest with you. So those are uh, out, Joe. Those are out. You're fucking out. Wednesday's fucking in, baby. We're doing this. Thursday yeah, we'll- nights at the Slop Shop. Let's get that trending. Thursday mornings, I should say. We'll leave the Raw and SmackDown talk to uh, Bruce Pritchard. How about that? We can let him take care of all that stuff. That'd be- That's fantastic. You can just hear him defend Vince McMahon for two hours. <laughs> I used to love the uh, the Bruce Pritchard podcast, and now it's just one shill after another. Still love Tony Schiavone because that man has no problem kicking himself while he's down. I'll tell you that much. But listen, without further ado, let's get into it, Joe. What show do you want to start with, Dynamite or NXT? Let's start with uh, with Dynamite because I know that both of us watched it live last night. So we'll start with Dynamite. Um, so the eight twelve. 20 edition of AW Dynamite. A um, couple of quick things, I guess, before we start. Excalibur still not on commentary due to some of his uh, situations going on there. And we have some fans in attendance wearing masks in uh, certain sections of the arena. So. Funny you should say that. I just read an account from a woman that was there as a fan. She said, um, and I quote, Groups of families were seated together. Sections were laid out beforehand, and the rest were taped off. Mask enforcement was there, correcting people's masks placement the entire night. Parties were grouped together and socially distanced between each group. They had it planned out beforehand because they had to know who was coming. Do not let the camera angle fool you. I felt safe, and so did my husband. There were no surprises. Um, They don't allow fans. I happen to have a very non-wrestling-related connection that happened to get me this opportunity. It is still a closed set. So while there were fans in attendance, they're not just off the street fans, I guess you would say. Joe, do you have a problem with this? No, I mean, I think as long as they're following whatever protocols are necessary to make sure everybody is safe, then I don't really have any issue with that. Um, You know, almost creating their own bubble-like scenario down there at uh, Daly's Place. And I think what you're also saying is that people are adults and they're responsible for their own actions, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, again, if, if they're making everybody wear masks and people choose to go to the show knowing that there will be other folks around. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think there's anything, anything wrong with that, personally. I would agree with you 100%. So, so we start with a match this week. It's the, the Young Bucks versus the Dark Order of uh, Stu Grayson and Evil Uno. Before the match gets started, the rest of the Dark Order attacked the Bucks during their entrance, um, giving them a little bit of an advantage to the Dark Order before the match started. Um, These two teams had worked before in Ring of Honor and PWG, um, back when the Dark Order was known as the Super Smash Brothers, I believe. Um, So I think they had a very, very good match. They seemed to know each other very well. A lot of typical Young Bucks spots. Uh, They were in trouble a lot of the match due to the pre-match attack. But uh, eventually the Young Bucks came out on top in this one. What did you think of this one, Mikey? I thought it was everything it needed to be. The Young Bucks got a good win. Um, The Dark Order is the Dark Order. And, you know, the uh, Super Smash Brothers and the Young Bucks have been wrestling for years. Uh, We saw them do it at PWG. There was, I believe, a Canadian Ring of Honor show where um, the Young Bucks took on uh, Stu Grayson and uh, Evil Uno. 
um, and it was a really good match. And they just know each other well. It was not necessarily a by the numbers tag match, but it was clearly four guys that have worked really well together. And I think it told the good story of I, the finish did fall, uh, fall a little bit flat for me, but it, that like that surprise finish without the crowd, no matter how you do it, I, I think it is going to fall a little bit flat, but it told the good story because they had thrown Matt in the, uh, the aisle way. I think it was, and they had the other dark order guys prevented from getting back in the ring. They were about to hit their finish and Nick got the roll up and escaped overcame the odds, didn't look like a superhero doing it, but did it smart. I think it was a really good tag match and a good way to start the show with the match, Joe. Way to go. Yes. Reminds me, they have, I feel like AEW kind of follows the old Monday Nitro um, formula, right? Where it starts off with usually like a really hot match, whether it be a, a cruiser match or a tag match, and, and it kind of sets the pace for the whole show. Yeah, I think that I, I do appreciate when they open with matches as opposed to 20 minute long promos. So I'm, uh, I'm all in for that. Uh, speaking of promos, next up we had MJF, who, as he's walking to the ring, has his own personal gum assistant to uh, place gum in his mouth when he's ready for that. Um, he comes to the ring to cut a promo on his campaign to become the new AEW world champion. Um, the polls show that he is ahead of John Moxley, five hundred percent to negative one thousand percent. I saw the I saw that poll. Yeah, I, did you participate in that poll? Were you part of that? No, no, uh, I um, uh, I don't. I'm not part of the MJF party, so I couldn't. Okay, vote. okay, the MJF party, who by the way has signs hanging and posters hanging around ringside for most of the show, which I think is a very nice touch. It's um, really. So he's talking about how Moxley is not there because of him and, you know, uh, calling him Dictator John and all this type of stuff. And then Moxley's music plays. He sends out Wardlow and other folks from his campaign team into the crowd, knowing that Moxley enters through the crowd. And, of course, Moxley enters through the regular entranceway and, and spikes him with a paradigm shift um, and then uh, walks away and cuts a promo on MJF, basically saying because MJF interfered in the title match last week that Moxley had with Darby Allen and said that they're going to, basically they're going to meet at all out on September 5th. Yeah. I, everything MJF does to me, Joe is gold. Um, the guy is hilarious. Everything he says is kind of rooted in truth, which I think makes it even more. So it was an enjoyable segment. Every time MJF is in front of the mic, it's an enjoyable segment. However, I probably would not have had Moxley get physical with MJF yet. Um, just outside looking in, I think MJF is doing everything he can to be a despicable douche. Could, 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 could get that trending despicable douche. Maybe we could work with that's that. The, that's the new Disney movie, right? No. Okay. No. Uh, but I think the, the reason why you buy a pay-per-view is to see the heel get their comeuppance. And I feel like MJF got his comeuppance last night when he got hit with that elevated uh, double arm DDT. So maybe that means MJF is going to win the title at all. Is it all out or all in? I think it's all out on September all out. 5th. Yeah, maybe it's um, maybe MJF wins the title. I don't know, but I just wouldn't have had Moxley be able to get his hands on him yet. But I thought the segment was good overall. I agree. I mean, any MJF promo, I think, is uh, he really always seems to nail it. So. Um... Yeah, and I thought this was a good a good way to continue to build build a few with some physicality um, between the two of them. So uh, next up, we have a backstage promo from Matthew Hardy talking about uh, Sammy Guevara using apparently the wrong chair to throw in his face and bust him open. He's not cleared to wrestle for ten days, but he will be cleared on Saturday, August twenty second, which is the next episode of Dynamite because it's being moved to Saturday because of NBA requirements or something. Oh! Some, some garbage. Anyway, he intimated that he would like to have a match with Sammy Guevara on that particular show. Yeah, it was okay. Um, he kind of went, like, in between all the different uh, Matt Hardy's... Uh, Matt Hardy's? How Hardy's? Mm. Hardy's? Mm -hmm. Matt Hardy's, I think is how you say it. I he, like, so. got a little broken towards the end, and then he beat the shit out of a referee because the referee from behind looked like Sammy Guevara. Um, I wasn't too in on this feud, before, like when it started, and then Sammy <laughs> chucking a folding chair at his face, full speed, point blank, kind of got me interested. Um, it was a uh, it was a sloppy move by Sammy Guevara. It was reckless and it was an immature 
move, I think, because he kind of froze under pressure. Even though the show was fucking taped, he probably could have done something else. But um, I don't ever really remember any other heat towards Guevara about being like reckless or something like that. So I'll chalk it up to maybe one time him getting caught in the moment. But he's got to be careful. That shit can really hurt somebody. Uh, that being said, I'm okay with it. I mean, I, I think Sammy will probably come out on the receiving end of this and, you know, be better for it. And hopefully uh, Matt Hardy just continues doing his thing and helping the young guys. Next up, we have the TNT title match, which is Cody Rhodes versus Scorpio Sky. Scorpio challenged him uh, the week before to this match on TNT. Scorpio Sky has been picking up a lot of wins on AEW Dark, which I know is one of your favorite shows to watch. Um, Cody enters with an entourage that I think uh, Mike Tyson would be jealous of. He's got about half of his family and several other people there with him now. Um, and referee Mike Kyoto of 30-year WWE fame makes his AEW debut here in this match. Um, I thought they had a very good match. Uh, they worked. Cody's ribs were an issue during the match, and Scorpio Sky was working on those. Um, I like it when they you know, tell stories and uh, use psychology and things of that nature, as some other old-school wrestling uh, promoters would say. Um, so I thought the match was very good. I actually bought into Scorpio Sky having a chance to win, which is more than I can say for a lot of the other challengers to the TNT title that Cody's had in the past. I thought they had a good match. Um, Cody ended up winning after hitting a second crossroads. What did you uh, think? I agreed with you. Um, I read a review of the show, and somebody was pooping on the fact that uh, it's the same story every week with them picking apart a body part on Cody and going after it. I think if you listen to the commentary, what they're doing is they're angling for Cody kind of taking on too much, taking on too many challengers, becoming broken down, and then somebody taking advantage of that. And I'm okay with that because it's long-term storytelling with like a story arc and a reason for it. JR was telling the story about how Cody's beat up. He's wrestling every single week. He's doing the EVP thing. He's I think burning the candle at both ends was what he said. And then Brody Lee comes out at the end and takes advantage of it and challenges him for next week. So I, I'm not, I'm not understanding the hate that Cody's getting uh, because let me tell you something, when somebody beats Cody for the TNT title, that person's going to be a made man and it's going to mean something. And Cody's, he's, he's just coming out each week and wrestling above average at worst matches. And I think Scorpio sky is another, um, is another example of that. I also bought into Scorpio Sky winning. I like the uh, whole thing of him kicking down the door in the beginning. I know it was like a subtle little touch, but I like things like that to kind of um, in this era when you can't really have elaborate entrances and stuff like that. It's just a little tweak that makes it a little more uh, personal, but I thought it was a, a very solid match and, and Cody continues to do his thing in this tournament and the new title looks awesome. Yes, agreed on the new title. Definitely a big improvement. Uh, the last thing on this segment is uh, after the match was over, uh, Brody Lee appeared on the screen and essentially challenged Cody to a TNT title match on the Saturday episode of Dynamite on August 22nd. So it looks like we're going to get Cody Rhodes versus Brody Lee for the TNT championship on the next episode of Dynamite. Uh, the next match is... Tag team title match, it's Hangman Page and Kenny Omega versus the Jurassic Express of Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. I um, thought they had a solid match, but honestly, so I, I like Jurassic Express, I do, but I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't want to say that they're green because that's probably not fair for me to say I'm not a wrestler, but I feel like they're not necessarily at the level of Omega and Page right now. So while I thought the match was good, um, probably not one of the best Page and Omega matches um, to, to date. I'm not really sure what that is on your... This is the leg of a dinosaur that Buster ate, so I thought it was topical. It is topical. Luchasaurus would appreciate you. Um, the only other thing, I guess, is, again, I don't want to be negative on, any, on anybody at all, but I think Jungle Boy does some cool moves, but I think sometimes they're a little bit... Um, maybe not. Yeah, a little sloppy, a little contrived at times. I'm sure, again, I'm sure he's, you know, he, he's relatively new to the business. So he's trying, he's working a lot of stuff in. He's very good. I'm very a big fan. But I think sometimes that stuff comes off as a little bit, um, you know, not as smooth as it, as it could be. But the match was, was solid. Um, I wouldn't say it was the best match on the show. 
and uh, Pay, Page and Omega ended up retaining the titles. Yeah, I'll piggyback on everything you said. I, I think there's a fair discrepancy in talent and no due respect. I mean, no disrespect, sorry. With all due respect and no disrespect to the guys in um, Jurassic Express, but it stood out to me like a sore thumb in this match. And I, I like all the guys. I, I am a fan of Jurassic Express, but Kenny Omega and Adam Page are probably two of the best in the world right now um, as far as professional wrestlers go, and probably for me a top five tag team. Um, Luchasaurus... Uh, here's the thing. You've got heat with Luchasaurus, right? Is that what this is about? Luchasaurus has heat with yeah. I have heat, heat with you. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have heat with Luchasaurus. Um, but I just he does do a lot of cool stuff too, and I I don't hate the gimmick. I thought it was actually pretty funny when he was like uh he was said hi to his mom on TV, and something about being seventy million years old, and then Taz said to Jr. I think he called his first match, which was really yeah. uh really good stuff <laughs> on commentary. Um, I don't know. I just – there's a disconnect there for me with him. I think he's a big guy that's maybe trying to do a little bit too much, and I'm also picking up what you're putting down with Jungle Boy. Um, I, he almost hurt himself real bad on that uh, corkscrew DDT off the top, and uh, Hangman Page somehow caught him and took a DDT. And probably – he didn't take it as he wanted to because he really spiked himself. But, uh, yeah, I mean – Listen, you got to give the tag team champions a win. They can't keep wrestling the same guys every week, but it's a lot of what I say with private party too. I feel like it's um, it's that young wrestler's mindset. And I'm not trying to be a cranky old douche. I mean, I'm not. I'm going to be 34 in a week. I'm not like that, you know, that old. I'm old, but I'm not that old. But like Arn says, like all, like JR says, slow it down a little bit. Like Scorpio Sky to me is a great example of somebody that's a, a really good professional wrestler can do a lot of the aerial stuff, and, but he, he, he picks his spots, he knows how to sell, and he doesn't o overdo things in the ring. Whereas I think Jungle Boy um, and guys like Private Party, they could really learn a lot from a, a Scorpio Sky. So I'm, I'm really with you on that one. Next up, real quick backstage segment, Santana and Ortiz uh, steal best friends gear bags and bleach them. Uh, I guess they best friends were looking for an apology after last week last week's attack on Trent's mom's fan, but Santana and Ortiz had other ideas, so that will further that that tag for you that they just started uh, about a week or so ago. Um, after that, this is go ahead. I'm sorry. I know I was going to say I like them getting a little more serious. I think they're both very funny, but Santana and Ortiz are a serious badass tag team. I think this is a, a new wrinkle to them, and I'm glad to see it. Yes, I agree. Speaking of tag teams, this is tag team appreciation night, by the way. And as during the course of the night, some different current teams have been naming their favorite teams along the way. Uh, so the segment we have next is the Young Bucks, the Rock and Roll Express, FTR, and Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson. And they all kind of put each other over for most of the segment until we get to Tully Blanchard, who uh, then proclaims that if you want to be the best tag team in the world, you need to have championships around your waist and which neither of those teams do. Um, he had a little heat with Arn Anderson because of a, a callback to a match that Cody and Sean Spears had last year. Wait a second. I'm sorry. A callback. What is that? Yeah. I mean, that's, I like that. I, I, I heard him say that. And I was like, you know what? That's good stuff. They, Cause they never touched on it. Arn came out. I think he spine busted Spears, right? Yeah, I believe and that. And then was. they never went back to it. And now then it so you don't want to see them two standing in a ring like they don't have heat with each other because a year ago he cost this guy a title and Tully's like, You cost my guy and I'm like, Holy shit, they remember. Like that was that meant so much to me. It, it's so nice to me. Yes, continuity is nice. So at that point, Sean Spears walks out walks out. Uh, Arn Anderson goes to leave to avoid any sort of situations. Um Rock and Roll Express and Tully Blanchard get into it, and it's all winds up with FTR uh, turning, turning heel. Um, they uh, attack the Rock and Roll Express, and I believe hit Ricky Morton with a spike pile driver, and then end up leaving the ring. So they had been basically acting as baby faces and friends to the Young Bucks since they arrived in AEW, which I think surprised a lot of people. I took this as a heel turn for them, uh, you know, attacking the Rock and Roll Express, especially in this tag team appreciation night situation. Um, and maybe we'll finally get them and the Young Bucks coming up soon. Yeah, I really liked it. Imagine how this 
imagine like you have rock and roll this show in greensboro north carolina right and you have the rock and roll express there who are looked at as like gods and then you have ftr you know spike them i think it would have gotten uh, an amazing reaction but i i, uh, I really like the segment I loved Ricky Morton's cell of a spike pile driver at 79 years old. It was, it was amazing. The segment was really good and it was everything it needed to be. Um, I don't know, man, that, uh, my hands cramping up like this. seems like we're getting a little bit of a tease of the four horsemen. You had Sean Spears come out, Sean Spears and FTR. This is long term booking one Oh one. This has been going on for, four months now five months with tully and sean spears uh I, I i like where it's going it's playing out week to week they're not it's not um hot shot booking it's i'm i'm all in on this and Arn anderson cut a great promo on tully saying i'm a grown-ass man i don't need to ask you things and i'm like aren't and tully gonna get into it and then ricky morton pie face tully so good man it, it was it was one of my favorite segments of the show couple of quick rapid fire segments next. We have a Chris Jericho backstage interaction with Mike Kyoto, basically trying to tell Kyoto to do the right thing, end quote, um, in the match main event tonight, which is Orange Cassidy against Chris Jericho. Um, we then have a quick match between AEW women's champion, non-title match, Hikaru Shida versus friend of the podcast, Killer Bay Heather Monroe. Um, match was I'm not very long. People. Joe, how many more people are we going to propel to the next level? <laughs> Keith Lee, Nick Aldis, Heather Monroe. There's, have, who else, Joe? Who else has joined our show and then went on to ranks of superstar? Well, uh, yeah. The house? All kidding aside, I, uh, it was great to see Heather Monroe on uh, television. Again, she had done a match on Monday Night Raw at one point against Nia Jax. I'd be curious if we get to speak to Heather Monroe again at some point, if she preferred working with Nia Jax or Hikaru Shida. That would be something we could – that would be a nice question to, to find an answer to. But I thought she did very well in, in the ring um, for the couple minutes that she had. She showed a lot of personality, a lot of character. Not that I'm a, any sort of judge of talent, but I obviously I'm a fan of hers. I thought she did really well. And Hikaru Shida gets a quick, a quick victory um, to continue to build her up in her AEW women's title reign. Yeah, she was awesome. She was talking shit the entire time. She got the quick jump on Shida. The announcers put her over. It was, you know, it, it was a quick win for Shida, but – Heather Monroe, like, she really stood out. When you watch that match, like, even the announcers were like, they, they were putting her over consistently. They're like, you know, she's, she has no uh, lack of confidence. It was just a really clean, good match. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, the Killer Bay on AW Dark soon. Maybe that leads to a spot on the show. Maybe we see another in the tournament. I don't know. But I want to see more of Heather Monroe in AEW. That's for sure. Yep. 100%. Uh, yeah, a quick backstage promo with Lance Archer and Jake Roberts, just Archer beating up some dudes in the back and everybody dies, etc. Uh, and now we have the main event, which is Chris Jericho versus Orange Cassidy, the rematch. So a couple things on this one. Uh, it is a $7,000. $7,000 obligation match, right? Because Chris Jericho's jacket was ruined by Orange Cassidy, so um, if he wins, he gets $7,000. Uh, so I have some thoughts on this one. So here, here's a couple of things. So the inner circle and best friends are banned from ringside in this match. They are not supposed to be at ringside. Um, that didn't last very long. Uh, the Santana and Ortiz and the best friends got into a brawl on the stage, which led to some distractions of Mike Kyoto, um, allowing Jake Hager to interfere in the match. Um, Kyoto teased help, you know, turning a blind eye to Jericho when he wanted to, uh, used some sort of foreign object on Orange Cassidy, but he did not did not go for that. Um, I thought the match was solid, but not great. Um, I liked their first match better, um, especially the th I guess at the end. And again, I'm not going to be too negative on anybody, but the finish was a little bit off uh, to me. I don't know if it was just kind of out of nowhere, um, the roll up or move that I believe Taz called a mouse trap was what Orange Cassidy used to pin Chris Jericho. So I know they, they played it up as a big moment. It is a big moment for Orange Cassidy. Chris Jericho does not lose a lot uh, in AEW, or he has not so far. But I think the finish was a little bit lacking to me, um, just in terms of, you know, the importance of it um, and the lasting impression. But I guess at the end of the day, they're going to be able to say that Orange Cassidy beat Chris Jericho, you know, from here forward. But I, I, was, look, I was looking for a little bit more 
out of the match. Uh, the finish was a little bit off to me, but I guess overall uh, the goal was accomplished if they want to try to get Orange Cassidy over, over more. Yep. Uh, I think and I'll have to rewatch it again. Cause I only watched it once. I'm pretty sure on the finish, Jericho was supposed to fall forward and do a forward roll and be trapped that way with the shoulders to the mat. Instead, he fo- um, he kind of rolled backwards. And either way, your shoulders are going to be on the mat, but this one just looked a little wonky, if you will. Uh, yeah, it was, a, um, it was an average match. Um, but like you said, I think the idea is to get Orange Cassidy a win over Chris Jericho and propel him and say now Orange Cassidy has beaten Chris Jericho. It was fine for what it was, um, but – on tag team appreciation night, I wanted to put the tag team titles on the main event. That's to me, the title always goes last. However, there was the $7,000 stipulation. So I can't really split hairs too much, but I would have put the tag titles on the main event, but overall a solid show, Joe, we're going schoolyard grades here. A to F. What do you give the show? Um, I think I would give it a B plus. I would go B plus for this show. Um, they had, again, most of the matches were good. There were five total matches on the show. I think they accomplished a lot. Um, you know, main event was a little bit, a little bit, you know, disappointing, but you know, not not too bad overall. So I'm gonna go with B plus. I also went with B plus, and I think I texted you last night. I said, you know, I'm watching AEW, and the show is all over the place. Hunter really is uh, agrees with me. The show is all over the place, but to me, like in a good way. There was they sprinkled a little bit of everything in there, and I think there were some things that are seeds planted for the future. Um, So, and they're not overdoing it with the guys they have. There was no Brian Cage this week. There was no Darby Allen this week. And it's okay for them to take a week off because you're going to make them feel fresh and you're going to elongate the storylines therein. So I I thought they did a good job. And overall, I would also give it a B plus. Excellent. Well, now it's time for your favorite and mine, the Wednesday night edition of NXT. Um, Before we, I guess one change to NXT this week is, Vic Joseph has joined the commentary team as opposed to Tom Phillips. He is the on-site commentator along with Mauro Ronaldo and Beth Phoenix. Nigel McGuinness, you are missed, my friend, if you are listening oh, to this. Love um, Nigel. He is listening. I'm sure he is. He told me last week. To, I'm sure, your um, surprise, we have started with a match on NXT as well. Karrion Cross versus Danny Birch. This was built off of a backstage attack from Karrion Cross in a recent episode of NXT. Uh, my favorite part of this match was Danny Birch's white boots. Um, I thought they were quite clean and impressive. Um, a lot of suplexes, a lot of suplays, as uh, Gordon Soley would call them, by one carrying cross. He gets a bit of a dominant victory um, after the fact. Keith Lee comes out after the match is over with a contract for an NXT title match at TakeOver 30. He asks them to sign the contract. Scarlett Bordeaux goes ahead and signs it. And when Keith Lee takes the contract back, it literally throws a fireball into his face. Okay, a couple things I took away. Um, Scarlet Bordeaux is a sorceress. And unconfirmed rumor, pretty sure it's true, she's actually the daughter of the Black Scorpion. Oh, okay. From so WCW that, fan. Oh. Yeah, so that's where the ability to throw fireballs come from. And I'm not a mathematician, Joe, but the Black Scorpion was 1990. It's the year 2020. Scarlet Bordeaux's right in that age range. The dude was out there slinging D game. Who knows, right? He was uh, he was over in the Carolinas. So I think she inhabited the the powers, the mystical powers of the Black Scorpion. Next week, she's going to make a tiger disappear. The week after that, we're possibly going to see uh, somebody saw it in half. I don't know. But I am all in for a mystical black scorpion-esque run from your girl, Scarlet Bordeaux. You, on the other hand, are not. That really went in a direction I was not expecting. Um, So, yeah, that was the opening segment. They definitely played up the uh, injury sustained by Keith Lee. Uh, They had split screen in the back for a while. Announcers laid out for a a few minutes. Um, Keith Lee eventually ends up going to the hospital, of course, pretty uh, not happy about the situation. However, one person who seemed to be unaffected by the situation is Drake Maverick, who came out to uh, a normal entrance, seemingly unfazed by the fact that the world champion had fire in his face a few minutes before that. 
He has a match up with Killian Dane for some reason. I don't know, but it does not last very long um, because the Undisputed Era interrupts, attacks both guys for a no contest, and Adam Cole cuts a very passionate promo against your new favorite, Pat McAfee. Is this, uh, this is the part where I give my thoughts on this, right? I mean, if you have any, this would be the time to give them. Sure. I have a couple. Let me just right, get back right. to Keith Lee real quick. Um, I thought it was before Keith Lee got, um, got Hadoukened in the face. I thought it was uh, good to see him finally showing some sort of emotion and not just, oh, hey, I'm Keith Lee. I'm here to beat the shit out of you and be really cool about it. So I, was, I, I liked his promo beforehand. Um, they hired Drake Maverick just so Drake Maverick wouldn't go anywhere else. Drake Maverick was as hot as he's ever been after he cut that promo on his Facebook, Twitter, whatever it was about crying about, um, you know, not having a job and stuff. And they give him a really good feel good run in the two Oh five live, whatever, whatever it was, but, and then he lost and then triple H came out and really hugged him and, and embraced him. And now he's back to fucking stupid. Just, I, I don't know, man. It, it's so it's so frustrating because Drake Maverick, you know, got himself over naturally by his own words, his thoughts, his ideas. The people are behind him. Millions of people are tweeting for Drake Maverick. The WWE has something hot. And they're like, oh, yeah, let's just put him in with fucking Killian Day. And, and it's it's really – it's 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 bad, Joe. It's not good. Um, go ahead. But, and oh, the, the Adam Cole thing and the Pat McAfee. Listen, you want to put Cody Rhodes with Arrow? Fine. He, I, I, I don't care because I'm not – Cody, I enjoy him as a wrestler, but at that point it was like, oh, okay, it's Cody Rhodes. He's not a champion. Adam Cole is the heart and soul of NXT right now. He carried the company on his back. He was champion for – was it a year, over a year, 300 days, whatever it might be? Over a he year. Just, yeah. Over a year, yeah. He lost the title to Keith Lee. He doesn't want a rematch. He doesn't want to go back after the title. You put the guy that is the, the, the best thing you have going in NXT, you put him against Pat McAfee, a punter? I don't want do – you? how excited are you for Pat McAfee versus Adam Cole? A retired punter? Um, I'm not really very excited. I don't really have – again, I don't know what McAfee can or can't do in the ring, uh, of course. I don't know if he's been training and we're not aware of it. Um, I know who Pat McAfee is. Do a lot of mainstream people know who Pat McAfee is? Probably not. So I'm not really sure how much this is gaining interest for NXT. I guess we'll see if the ratings indicate anything when they come out later today. Um, I can only hope that Adam Cole gets a victory out of this, but I... Beats I the know. shit out of him. I want Adam Cole to beat the shit out of Pat McAfee. You have a guy, a punter making fun of Adam Cole's height on TV, calling him short. What What is the one thing that you said you didn't want Adam Cole to go – the one reason why you didn't want Adam Cole to go to Raw or SmackDown, Joe? What did you say? Because of the perception that he's too small and he'd probably get jobbed out on the main roster with a bunch of big uh, – facing a bunch of big dudes all the time. Now he's getting jobbed out to, to a fucking punter, a, a bar stool sports – contributing Dave Portnoy-esque uh, adult bro like is coming in and he is making fun of your NXT champion for his height. I thought in, I thought in wrestling, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm going off on a tangent here because it's Adam Cole and we love Adam Cole. You don't call somebody short. You don't call somebody fat. You don't call somebody old, right? Because you don't get over by beating a short, a fat, or an old guy. Because the perception is if they are that, then they're supposed to lose, right? Like, you, those are things you don't go at. What happened when Jerry Lawler called Taz a midget or a leprechaun on TV? Taz almost dumped him on his head as a shoot, and he stormed out. Like, I, I, and, like, ah, it's just so maddening that you would do this. Because Adam Cole's not a big guy. It, it, it's, it would be one thing if he was, like, 6'2", and he's, like, joking. He's calling him a little guy because Pat McAfee's 6'3", right? But when you put Adam Cole next to a Roman Reigns – or even next to a Daniel Bryan, he's a lot shorter. And that now people are going to focus on that because you have a punter. A punter, Joe. 
like, I'd rather have Mongo, who got physical. Okay, I'd rather have Kevin Green, who got physical on the football field, than a punter. You have the weakest position in football making fun of your NXT, former NXT champion because of his height. Am I alone? This can't be just me. No, I don't think it's just you, but I think we've spent a good amount of time talking about Pat McAfee, so I'm going to move on to the next match. Match number three. Yes, we're up to match number three already on this show. Tyler Breeze versus Santos Escobar, the NXT Cruiserweight Champion. There's a distraction by the rest of Santos Escobar's group, which I can't pronounce the name of, something Phantasma. Um, and Escobar ends up getting the win. Fondango comes back with an arm and a sling to help save Tyler Breeze, but he gets beaten down as well. And then Swerve Scott comes out to make that save in the line of interference. Say, I don't know, whatever. Um, they mentioned the one thing that I took away from this was just that Swerve Scott is the only person to defeat Santos Escobar in NXT so far, which seems to me they're going to set up that as the next NXT title match. Uh, excuse me, NXT Cruiserweight title match um, down the line, which I'm sure that match will be good. But enough. I like Tyler Breeze. Um, enough with Brizongo for me. I, I can't. I thought the whole reason why Breeze went back to NXT was because they didn't want to be joking around with Brizongo, and then literally like a month or two later, they're right back to being Brizongo again. So um, not not a huge fan of that. But I guess I am a fan of Santos Escobar getting wins. I like that group. I think it's presented pretty well. Um, I thought he cuts. I think he cuts a good promo. So that's the. That's my, if I'm going to be positive, that's my positive takeaway from this match. Yeah, I went off on a tangent last time, so I'm just going to agree with everything you said. However, I will say when Brizongo had a serious tag match was it three weeks ago? I remember. I forget who it was. It was Brizongo, Undisputed Era, maybe Lorcan and Birch. I don't remember. But there were like two weeks back to back where Brizongo had a very good series of matches and they were serious matches and I think the people were really getting behind them only to have the rug pulled out from underneath us but to be positive Santos Escobar uh he's great and that whole that whole faction if you will I think is presented in the way the Andrade faction on Monday Night Raw should be presented instead of losing and looking like shit on Raw like these guys are you know they're they come together for good wins, good matches, and just this good momentum behind them. So I'm with it. I agree. That's a good point. Yeah, I think this is – that's what Andrade and Garza should be, and uh, doesn't that doesn't seem to be happening. So. Well, Rick Flair is not with uh, Santos Escobar yet, so. In time. In time, my friend. In time. Um, match number four. Indy Hartwell versus the uh, emotional Mia Yim. Mia Yim had apparently made it to the local medical facility and back in time. Hospital, for, right? Is it a hospital? Can is it a hospital? hospital? I think she said hospital. I don't know. I, I like to make sure that I have my Vince McMahon terms correct. So um, Mia Yim ends up getting the win in this match after a few minutes. I, I don't really know if there's too much to say about this uh, other than other than that. So Needs more uh, heaven. Yes, needs more Killer Bay. Um <clears throat> We have a Finn Balor promo, basically building up a match against opponent that he doesn't know who it's going to be for next week. The winner of that match will get a spot in the North American title ladder match at TakeOver 30. Yes, we'll get back to that in a little bit as well. Speaking of the ladder match at TakeOver 30 for the vacant North American title, we have Damian Priest versus your boy, Bronson Reed. This is uh, both of these guys have qualified for the ladder match at Takeover 30. They had a parking lot interaction last week that led to this match and the challenge. And one Bronson Reed gets the victory in this match. What did you think of this match and the angle? Way too much punishment, Martinez, Joe. The guys on TV every week. He's a vampire. He's a vampiric face now. Um, listen, at least they're trying something with Bronson Reed. They're, they're giving a little backstory to him. I was a little more invested in him because I know, like, who he was and, and why he was wrestling, and it was very human. So I thought that was pretty good. I'm not I, – I just don't bind Damian Priest. I'm sorry. So at least, you know, at least they're doing something with Bronson Reed is all I'm going to say. I'm not going to be negative anymore. Yeah. Speaking of being negative, I don't want to be too negative. But one quick thing, there was a somewhat – 
uh, sloppy frog splash or splash off. It's not maybe not a frog splash. A splash off the top rope from Bronson Reed, where I think Damian Priest was supposed to move, but didn't get out of the way completely. So it was kind of like a did he hit him? Did he not? Type of moment. And uh, Bronson Reed ended up winning with a jackknife cover, not a power bomb, a jackknife cover. Uh, next up is probably your favorite segment of the show. The Robert Stone brand, Aaliyah and Mercedes Martinez in a tag match against Casey Catanzaro and Caden Carter. Before the match starts, um, Robert Stone tries to recruit Casey Catanzaro to his group. Um, for reasons only known to her, she rejects the offer and steps on Robert Stone's injured foot. That just seemed unnecessary uh, to me. I'm not sure why that had to occur. Um, but Martinez and Aaliyah end up getting the victories. Mercedes Martinez, again, is, looks uh, very good in the ring. They're putting her over pretty strong as a, um, a very dangerous competitor in the women's division. After the match is over, Rhea Ripley comes out super angry, but not so angry that she doesn't get to do her full entrance with her stomp um, and attacks and has a brawl with Mercedes, Mercedes Martinez, um, Aaliyah, of course, is still there and tries to help, and Shotzi Blackheart comes out to even the odds. So I would imagine we're going to get a tag match between those two teams at some point here. But I, I will say that at least they've made me somewhat interested in seeing Mercedes Martinez against Rhea Ripley. I'll, I'll give them that as far as the positive. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Mercedes Martinez. You and I have been for a while. Uh, she's been on the show before. We've seen her at Shine and Evolve shows. Um, she's great, you know, and I think they're doing a really good job of pushing her and making her feel important. And Robert Stone is going to the Bobby Heenan School of Managerial Je ne sais quoi. And uh, it, it's, I, love, I love everything Robert Stone does. The, he, it's, it's so good. It's so funny. And I'm loving the Robert Stone, Mercedes Martinez pairing. Uh, I'm all in on everything Robert Stone and Mercedes. So. We have a couple of quick segments here before we get to the main event. We have a Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae uh, segment from home. Uh, they have not at the dinner table this time. Dinner, I think, had been eaten. Candice LeRae was reading a story to their dog. Johnny Gargano is on a ladder fixing something in the house. This was basically all just to mention that, uh, you know, Candice has issues with some of the other women in NXT that she brought up, and Johnny is preparing for his la to have a match next week on NXT against Ridge Holland. And the winner of that will go on to the North American title ladder match at TakeOver 30. My favorite part of this segment was Johnny Gargano calling himself the Wednesday night. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I might start calling myself that going forward. I'm not sure. Can uh, I call you the Thursday morning? Like M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G? Yeah, that sounds right. Something that yeah. involves me being dead inside. Um, yeah, Thursday morning. That's great. So Gargano versus Rich Holland is next week, and then there's going to be an Adam Cole versus Pat McAfee face-off next week as well, which I'm sure that you'll be tuned into. All I care about is that Candace and their dog got screen time, and uh, it's really cool they keep putting Candace over. Have her win a fucking match, Joe. You want to keep doing these cool vignettes at her house? I'm all for it. Stop having her take the pin in bullshit tag matches. Fair. That's a fair point, Mike. So we have the main event, which is a triple threat. It is the final triple threat qualifying match for the North American title ladder match. Even though we still have two singles matches next week to determine the final two competitors. I, I can't follow this logic. It's like being in a hedge maze. Um, so it's Kushida versus Cameron Grimes versus what was a mystery opponent. The mystery opponent is the Velveteen Dream. Mike, your reaction. Well, uh, I personally was hoping that when the Velveteen Dream came out, uh, Chris Hansen's To Catch a Predator was going to meet him in the ring, and it was like a sting operation. But it seems like that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the case. So I was a little disappointed. Yeah, I think we all were. I think that but we all were. I'm going to say this, but uh, I, realistically, they had a video package for Kushida beforehand about how it was time for him to come back and – he needs to be taken seriously. So what better way to put him in a match and have him lose? And Cameron Grimes won the match, right? Yes, Cameron Grimes pinned Kushida. Yes, poor Kushida. I wonder if he's regretting these coming to the United States to uh, work in NXT. I'm sure um, being IWGP uh, junior heavyweight champion is right up there with almost 
with getting pinned with uh, by Cameron Grimes. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't want to go off on a uh, hashtag speaking out tangent. There was uh, monumental amounts of evidence against the Velveteen dream, right? Like there was like video, or I'm sorry, there were pictures and there was audio and nothing was ever said about it, right? It wasn't like, it, um, like a Matt Riddle situation where Matt Riddle had come out and, and spoken about it. This was like, there's so much about the Velveteen dream brushed under the rug and then he's just back on TV. Is that, is that fair? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know what all evidence there was, to be honest. I didn't, um, that whole stuff, that situation stuff creeps me out. So I, I know there was some audio of it. Um, I just assumed that he was taken off of television because of that situation. And I'd even read some things like people were thinking he was going to get released and stuff like that, but evidently that's not the case. And he re uh, reappeared tonight on NXT did not take the pinfall or loss in the match. So that means that next week he's going to face Finn Balor with another chance to qualify for the North American title ladder match at takeover 30. Um, as you mentioned, Kushida stuff, I won't repeat any of that, but after the match was over, the Velveteen Dream attacked Kushida, seemingly turning back heel after the match was over, and then... I did a couple of weeks ago, Joe. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, you mean with the... Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you did there. Um, and then the show ends with a stare down between him and Finn Bauer as they are facing each other next week. So that is NXT from August 12th this week. Uh, I guess let's go with what's your school rating for this match. And then we can talk about, well, I guess based off the ratings, we'll know which one's better, but uh, we can talk about the comparison between the two and wrap this up. C minus. Hmm. I was going to go C. Yeah. So I'm, I'm right, kind of right there with you. Uh, probably gave, I probably gave a little extra credit for Robert Stone just because he's, uh, you know, he's turning into a hero of mine at this point. They have um, to, we, you, I, we need Robert Stone brand shirts. Yeah, if we can get those, actually, we need to we need to look into that if they don't have them, and then maybe get some marketing out there for uh, for Robert Stone. Yeah, I just I just there were seven matches on that show in two hours. Um, so I, I think the only one that really I thought the the Bronson Reed and Damian Priest match was pro was pretty solid. Uh, the main event was fine for what it was, but it was kind of um, I don't know. The Cameron Grimes win took the wind out of my sails a little bit. Um, you know, so I mean, I get what they're doing with the NXT ladder match, uh, North American title ladder match thing. They're trying to get some new faces in there. You know, they've got Bronson Reed, they've got Damian Priest, now they have Cameron Grimes. So I guess they don't really want it to be the same old, you know, Johnny Gargano and Roderick Strong and people like that. So I get it. Um, but some of these guys, I think, um, need a little bit more time to get to that spot. Um, I, mean, I think Damian Priest, I'm okay with. But whatever. You know, anyway, I guess that's what they're building to. They'll this convoluted way to get to that ladder match um, at the next takeover. But there's some stuff on the show that I just, you know, just kind of seemed there. Again, the Prisongo stuff seems like it shouldn't be on the show to me. Um, the Mia Yim match just seemed kind of random, other than to just put over the fact that she was, you know, upset about Keith Lee, but you didn't really need to have her in a match. You probably should have lost if that was going to be the right. case. But you want to build up Indy Hartwell, who's new, uh, you know, a new face in the company. I'm with you on that. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I gave it a C. I mean, to me, AEW is the clear, the clear winner. Um, they're definitely setting up a lot of stuff for not only their next Saturday show, but also All Out, which is a little less than a month away. Um, I know NXT has their takeover coming up in about a week, a week and a half. But um, off the top of my head, I probably couldn't tell you the entire card. And that's, I think that's one of the things. Like, if I don't know exactly what's going on in the card, I should be able to rattle off all the feuds, and maybe it's me. But um, other it's than not, they just right. signed the Cross versus Keith Lee match. We have a ladder match for the North American title, which we don't know the participants in um, at this moment. Um, I think we, I know we have Io Shirai and Dakota Kai. I know that. Um, and I don't think we have much else that's definitive at, at this moment, unless I'm forgetting something. So maybe. No tags and titles that I'm aware of either. Not that I know of. I mean, Gargano is, is up in the air because he's he might be in the North American title match. Balor is up in the air because he might be in the North American title match. Um, the oh, oh, we have Cole and Pat McAfee. Sorry, I forgot about that. How could I forget? So, um, yeah, so I think there's some things, but I just feel like, um, yeah, it doesn't have the, the buzz and appeal of some of the past takeovers that uh, I know we've, we've enjoyed for many years. So I'm going to go see, and uh, AEW gets the win for the night. 
for me. AW also gets the win for me. The reason why, like you said, there were seven matches on the NXT, and I off the top of my head, like I, I can't go back and remember like what I liked about the matches. Um, I don't like the Pat McAfee bullshit. I don't like what they're doing to Adam Cole. I think Adam Cole deserves better. As a matter of fact, I might get that trending uh, right now after I get uh, Thursdays at the sloppy shop trending or the slop shop. That's going to be my new thing. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it, nothing stood out to me. Usually each week on NXT, there's like one or two like really, really good segments and even a match that's above average like the week before was um, Imperium and O'Reilly and, and Fish and we didn't get that this week. And the, the stories are very convoluted. I, I'm loving the Robert Stone brand. I'm a big fan of Mercedes Martinez, which I went into. And I also like what they're doing with Io Shirai and Dakota Kai. I think those are a, a good promo segment, a, a good vignette, if you will. But um, AEW was the clear-cut winner for me this week. They had matches that were impactful. You had, you know, and like you said, too, they – I know what's going to happen on next week's AEW show. I know where they're going. And, and the storylines are, they have so much more thought going into them. Um, so I hope that NXT can continue with like the Mercedes storyline and things like that. But I just don't have a lot of hope for it lately. Um, but this week, so 8-12-2020 for us, AEW clear cut winner. Um, next week, we will be back with, I'm not sure what day we're going to do a show, Joe, because we have NXT on Wednesday and then we have NXT TakeOver on Saturday and the AEW show on Saturday. So maybe we'll do a Sunday morning show. Sunday morning, super Sunday showdown. I, I, I got to think of another uh, trending hashtag gimmick for that. But thank you guys for checking out Thursday morning at the hashtag slop shop. Um, we appreciate you hanging out with us in this week's episode of the all night long wrestling podcast we'll be back next week he is your host he's a stallion i am the enforcer and we are tapping out now with the best friends